and Asia, um, and it was all ba it was even pre GPS. So most of our calculation of location were based on cell towers. So we took three cell towers, and we could tell you in a proximity of 500, uh, 700 meters where your friends are, where you are, and in cases of dating, you could actually meet strangers based on that. So things that today are completely obvious. Um, I did it for a few years, and then there was a disconnect. And the disconnect was that I'm doing entertainment. Most of my audiences are not even in the country I, I grew up in. And the situation outside is still that intense reality, and something didn't make sense. So I went on a journey. I went from one small place to another small place, Pittsburgh, US, and that was nine years ago. And I found, really by accident, a great uh, a master's program in Carnegie Mellon, which is, you, you might say, a kind of an equivalent or a, in the same domain of the media of the Media Lab in the idea of art and science, uh, bring people that are coming from design, bring people that are coming from technology. Any idea who this guy is? Randy Pausch. And Randy Pausch started the program that I, um, I went to, uh, the Entertainment Technology Center. Those of you who don't know the story, I really recommend you to watch what's called his last lecture. Uh, Randy Pausch was a uh, very known uh, computer scientist and uh, uh, very good at what he did with uh, uh, virtual reality and, and other research in uh, entertainment technology. But he got even more famous in the last six months of his life. Uh, and uh, he did this last lecture when uh, uh, he got uh, news that he's going to die of cancer in six months. Um, usually the last lecture is a phrase that professors use when they move from one university to the next. In his case, it was literally the last lecture. And uh, he did it in Carnegie Mellon. A student took it on video. Uh, it wasn't the intention. He put it on YouTube. It became a viral uh, video that was watched by millions of people. And Randy became um, very quickly some type of a guru, and mainly because the talk was very inspirational and very positive. He basically said, at the age of 46, I achieved most of my childhood most of my childhood dreams. Um, and I feel very strong and very confident, you know, going to my, uh, meet my fate. And um, then he wrote a book about it, and he was in every talk show possible. But just to tell you this story about, you know, how lucky I was to meet this man, and when I came to the US um, on the first day of my, uh, class, of my semester, I pitched a, an idea for a project. And the idea was, I'm going to make a game about peace in the Middle East. And that was the feedback. <laughs> so to be honest, that's not his vocabulary. What Randy said was, he was sitting there in the long table with all the other faculty, and he said, widely out of scope. Very interesting, but widely out of scope. Uh, to his credit, he let us do it, a group of young students I was a bit older than everybody else because of the army service and uh, other adventures. Um, and we went into the unknown. We had no idea how tough it's going to be. Um, and not only that we made a successful student project, we actually got a lot of attention while at school. And uh, we commercialized it and went out as a company, Impact Games, that I mentioned before, and released it to the public, self-published it, and called it Peacemaker. And the idea of Peacemaker was that it's a game about perspectives. So you can actually play both sides, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. The other idea was that it's going to be very realistic. So we were one, maybe the first gaming company that went to Reuters to license footage to use in the game. And you'll see it when, in a video I'll show you in a second. Um, other things that were uh, very unique to Peacemaker were the idea that you can uh, make very strategic decisions, but we're not limiting you to only nonviolent uh, decisions. Part of what we try to show is how violent and intense reality is. So if you want to respond militarily, in a military way, you can do it. If you want to uh, attack the other side, you can do it. And in, in some cases, the game even um, uh, we, we'll give you feedback that it's not 
it's not about wrong and right. It might be that at that moment, showing your people that you are taking security actions is the right thing uh, for that uh, specific moment. I want to show you this video uh, that is a combination of media clips. We got a lot of attention, as you can imagine. We're talking about 2004, 2005. Uh, games in the news are all about Grand Theft Auto 3. It's the worst thing ever. Our kids are, you know, being uh, uh, basically uh, uh, forced to play all those violent games. And then a team at Carnegie Mellon is making a game about peace. What could be a better story? So we got a lot of uh, attention in both sides and in America. And that actually drove a lot of our motivation to continue with it. Uh, and you'll see some images that we'll talk about uh, in a second. Peacemaker is a game in which you take the role of one of the leaders. You can take either the role of the Israeli Prime Minister or the Palestinian President. You can play both perspectives. And the idea is that as the leader, you have to react to real-time events happening in the world. You can negotiate with other leaders, but you also have security or military actions that you can take. And by doing so, you have to reach a peaceful solution while in office. In an Israeli high school, a new computer game called Peacemaker was launched today. Children playing the role of Israeli and Palestinian leaders trying to make peace in a virtual world of suicide bombings and Israeli military strikes. We don't expect to address all issues of the conflict. We don't expect to give all the answers. We're bringing up issues for discussion. I think the best aspect of playing this game is that, especially if you're Palestinian student in the territories or an Israeli student within Israel, you, you get a chance to really feel what both sides are thinking and get a better sense of what they can do together to work towards peace. If you look at the video game industry today, there are so many games out there about violence, about war, about destructions. We say a simple thing, there is certainly a place for one little game about peace. So this is when I was uh, very young and naive, but, uh, but you saw some glimpses of how the game looks and how it's, it's being covered and perceived, and we were very, very scared about uh, the feedback that we'll get and about how people will react, and uh, that drove a lot of our decisions, and at the end we, we kind of enjoyed a pretty positive uh, uh, coverage and critique, and a lot of it was because of the two sides because we almost made two games in one, and we could, that gave us the freedom to kind of really portray one, uh, like the agenda of the Israelis, one point of view very, in a very clear way, and then the Palestinian view and their agenda, and we also met experts from both sides in order to, to come up with you know, the logic behind the decisions and the consequences. Uh, you saw this guy in the, in the video, one thing that happened a lot when we showed the game, people said, oh, you should have politicians uh, play this. And we had. So one of them is Danny Atom. He's the uh, ex-Mossad head in Israel. At that time, he was a candidate for prime minister. And for some reason, he made the mistake to play the game on live TV. Um, that was Channel 2 in Israel. Can you guess how long it took him to lose the game? Five minutes. So the game basically, the game has a winning condition that you can really reach the two-state solution. But it has two, in, in both sides, they're different, but there are two losing conditions. One is that you obviously, if you're the Israeli leader, you upset the Israeli public and the Israeli stakeholders so much that they basically kick you off the office. But on the Palestinian side, there is the third intifada. And this is what he got after five minutes. And when the reporter is asking him on, again, live TV, what do you think about the game? He's saying, 
unrealistic. I did all the right things. And that was after he, uh, he did an Apache strike, he did another military action, and when he said, I'm moving to diplomacy, he took the most harsh, the harshest um, action on the menu, which was put pressure on the other side to give away the militants or something like that. So we, we kind of figured out that the politicians maybe is not the right way to go, and it's a bit, it's a bit too late, probably. And then we had, we had much better, uh, uh, I would say, success or at least uh, engagement with the young generation. So what happened was that the Perez Center, you know, Shimon Perez, the current president of Israel, uh, he started the, the Perez Center as an NGO, I think, 12 years ago. And we made a deal with the Perez Center, which was very unique. They bought from us 100,000 copies of the game, 100,000. And it was uh, physical CDs. So we actually shipped from the US um, a huge uh, amount of CDs to Israel. And uh, what they did with them was even more interesting. They took 80,000 and they put them in the newspapers. So at the day of the Annapolis summit, uh, 2008, people that are subscribers to both Haaretz in Israel and El Quds in the West Bank, when they opened the newspaper, they got a free CD with Peacemaker, which you can imagine in a very small, um, you know, small countries, let's say, um, it, it becomes immediately the talk of the day and people spoke about it um, between themselves and on the radio and other places. The other thing that they did is they saved 20,000 copies for later uh, work uh, in a much more, I would say, high touch, much more deeper engagement with the public. So if the, the cities were distributed almost like mass media, that people will discover them, the 20,000 went to workshops in both Israel and the West Bank. Uh, sometimes but they do it until this day, and sometimes it's very hard uh, in terms of access, to even get there, or to even uh, um, get uh, the permission from teachers or parents. And I want to tell you one story that, you know, when I went to Israel on a visit, I, I got to see one of those workshops. And then it was a huge arm moment for me. Um, I saw how it was introduced in class, and how the kids played it. And um, it was a high school in Israel, uh, the kids were 17, so it's like one year from going to the army. It wasn't a remote, you know, it was an urban uh, community, uh, very close to Tel Aviv. And what happened is that when the kids started to play the game, they just took the most violent actions immediately. So, and this is something, by the way, we saw. What happens with games is that people many times test the boundaries, you know, they're kind of trying to see where is the lose state before they kind of start bl playing balance. But, of course, the questions started to be uh, asked by the instructor, and they asked, why did you attack the Palestinians? I mean, why did you take uh, this measure or the other? And the answer was, the answers that started coming uh, up from the students were so, so weak in terms of understanding of the situation that it was really painful to watch. Um, a lack of understanding of the geography, you know, saying things like Hamas are not Palestinians, you know, not understanding that it's, it's another group inside the Palestinian, uh, thinking that an Israeli city is actually a settlement. So what I understood from that experiment is, on one end, you know, the sad fact that the level of ignorance is so high and that there's so much to do before we even talk about building peace. Let's talk about understanding the basics of what's going on and the narrative, narratives of both sides. Um, and, the, and the other thing I understood is that the game itself was an experience that was very interesting. But much more interesting was the discussion around it. And in a way, that was the only discussion that those kids had about the conflict in their whole studies. Because the education system doesn't encourage this discussion. It's not in the curriculum. They're trying to, as much as, as they can, actually put it you know, under the rug and not, not talk about it. And the game, in a way, was a trigger for something much larger. So talked about Peacemaker. Now let's talk about games. Because for me, that moment said, 
okay, there's so much potential here. Yeah, I could continue and make peace games, but for me it was also, there's so many things we can do in social change that eventually many of them lead to building peace, but it's also about awareness and understanding and learning and uh, entering the shoes of the other side. And this leads me to Games for Change. So I want to speak to you about those kind of games that are created uh, uh, for purpose, okay? Uh, trying to think about games not as a, a pure entertainment, but as a medium. A medium that can actually bring change. Um, you can still see some of that perception today. I, I think that we advanced a lot in the last 10 to 11 years as game makers and, and people understanding what we do, but you still get, uh, just like Clinton said in 2005, you might get it today, especially from a generation that didn't grow up with games. So the idea that it's violent, it's shallow, and that the kids should do anything else but play games because it's so harmful. And that's, by the way, despite all evidence that shows, I'm not talking about the violence aspect, I'm talking about what it actually develops in a, in a kid, in a child. The other perspective that we were struggling with, late Roger Ebert, that says, guys, you're not even creating art. You're not even creating, it's not a medium. What you're dealing with, no matter how hard you try, will never be at the level of the masterpieces of TV or film. And this is another thing that we, we're fighting against and trying to, to um, uh, prove wrong, right? Let's talk about the power, though. This is something that no one can ignore because these are odd numbers. $66 billion is the industry worldwide. We're talking everything, hardware and software. This is in many countries already larger than film and music together, also in the US. One billion in three days, that happened in November, that was the launch of GTA V, Grand Theft Auto. The biggest entertainment launch in history versus any other product you can think of. Um, and of course, those numbers just got amplified and doubled and tripled since then. 30 years old, that's another number we should watch because it's changing all the time and getting higher. What's the average age of a player? We're not only talking about kids anymore. We're talking about people playing. If this is the average, obviously above that uh, age, we see it on Facebook where the average is much higher. It's 37, and it's actually most females that are playing, especially in the US. We're talking about playing in the subway. We're talking about iPhone and Android games. The, the diversity and the demographic is changing so quickly that we're talking about a much wider audience and bigger possibilities for the medium. And the competition about, on time. So it's not only the financial numbers that are very strong. The competition on time, games are winning and, uh, and winning big. This is a Nielsen number from a few years ago talking about online activity. And it's the first time that games came second before email. So people play games online more than they use their email. Any idea what's number one? Social networks, and social networks arguably are driven a lot by game, game play as well. Uh, in Facebook, it's, it's probably above 50% of, of the traffic. So what's the responsibility? That's my daughter, sorry I had to show the picture, uh, when she was 18 uh, months old. But the idea to me is um, if we have this power and if we're winning the competition of time with games, and that means that she might play games more than any other thing she'll do in her life in terms of entertainment, engagement, learning, and media. And I want that, that thing to start to be more balanced. I mean, it can't be that such a strong medium will deal only with fighting, sports, um, you know, abstract entertainment, and won't deal with, with real events and real issues and current events. Every medium does it. It's not a new thing. Think about books. And it's not about if you do that, you're not successful, because you can be very successful. This is one proof from books that you can speak about the most complex and serious issues of your time and still reach a huge audience. Graphic novels. This is a great example that I wish that we could replicate one day, 
that comic books until 92 suffered from the same image that we have with games. Shallow, uh, they can't deal with serious issues. Then you have one masterpiece, Mouse by Art Spiegelman, Persopolis is kind of the new generation, wins the Pulitzer Prize, hugely successful, tells the most profound personal story about uh, the life of, of his father in the Holocaust, and not only changing the medium, the name comic books is not good enough anymore. They need something new, and they come with graphic novels. So maybe games one day will, will have another name, something that can be broader in what we can tackle emotionally and intellectually. Mesh, um, besides the two last Super Bowls, that the last episode of Mesh was the most viewed TV show on, uh, in uh, the history of the US. Think about that, how successfully you take a context that is very serious and do something that is actually a satire, that, that uh, deals with, with it with humor. Again, this is something I want games to, to do as well, be more sophisticated in how we, we deal with serious issues. Documentaries, that's an obvious example. I'm, I'm bringing Al Gore because it was interesting what uh, impact it had on the, on the global conversation with very little, you know, with a PowerPoint. But when people always say, yeah, let's compare games for change to documentaries, but it's still a niche, let's look, let's look at the Oscars. Last five years, look at the winners. I mean, the only uh, move, the only entertainment movie that won was in 2012. All the rest were entertainment about real world events, political and social issues. And by the way, if you look at the last two years, even at the, at the level of the deck, you know, the nominees, you have almost half of them that deal with real world events, true stories. So we're, not, we're talking about blockbusters as well in other media. So what we say, games could be meaningful too. How do we get there? How do we get there? So we, we run Games for Change. Games for Change is not only an organization, it's, it's really a movement. It's really about how do we build a field? Just like this conference is about building a sector around a piece in technology, that's what we're doing with games. We start with a festival, okay? That was the first idea. And obviously the language is taken from movies. Can we be the Sundance of this, or the Tribeca? And uh, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the festival that we're having in two weeks, which is a breakthrough. You know, in 10 years, we grew up from being 40 people in a room, that was in 2004, to having now 800 people, and a public day for the first time that we're doing with the Tribeca Film Festival, on the street, showing games for good both digital and non-digital. So really a huge uh, uh, move. And also in terms of who's coming to speak in, in, in our events. Sandra Day O'Connor, you can't, you can't uh, accuse her of, of being a gamer. Uh, she came first time in 2008 and came again in 2010, and I'll show you that she's actually making video games in, in a few minutes. Um, the US CTO back then, Anish Chopra, came in 2010, and our big moment, Al Gore in 2011, whether people, uh, whatever uh, opinions they had about Al Gore and his message, it was a huge moment because it showed what, how normal games became that Al Gore is giving the keynote of the Games for Change Festival in New York. Another thing that is, is going on, another trend that we see is more and more research. So many people say, show me the impact. You know, can, uh, does it really work? and more and more very serious organizations are showing the impact. Uh, Gates Foundation released a study about education just a year ago that shows that it's, it's a meta uh, study out of around 77 other reports uh, around the years, and it shows that increase of 12% uh, in education, especially around STEM, uh, science, tech, uh, engineering, and math, when digital media, specifically games, are being used versus a control group or control groups, because it's a meta study, that are not using games or, or new media. Um, we're seeing more and more money being, being invested. As I mentioned, the Gates Foundation is an example. A lot of mainstream organizations, including the US government on its multiple agencies. 
uh, including corporations. So you have the public, the, the private sector, the government. Um, what we're trying to do when building the sector is making sure that it's not just a passing fashion and that actually the, the investment is sustainable. That people are, because if you think about it, games are built on sequels. Unlike movies, when sequels are usually worse than the original, in games it's the opposite. Because it's such a complex product to make, the sequels are just getting better. The technology, the platform is there, and then you learn from your audience what you need to improve. And many times, you just get, you're getting better and better. And that's what we want to see with Games for Change. Make a pilot, but then make the next version and the next version. Don't go away and invest in something else. Um, we also see a new ecosystem that is pretty complex in the sense that if you're a game maker on the creative uh, bubble here, it's not enough that you, you, you know how to make great games. You must work with the people that understand the content. You know it in every other technology. In games, it's even more complex because you need to get this content into the design in a very organic way. Otherwise, it, it doesn't work. And the other thing that we started seeing is, is more and more global interest. So now we started uh, doing those licensed chapters, and uh, we have uh, five of them around the world. And the idea that more and more coming to us, people from different countries, and say, can we replicate Games for Change in our country? What does it mean? What does it take? Um, and usually it comes from an entrepreneur that have a very strong network and, and a very strong motivation to do that. Um, now I want to show you a, a few case studies. I just want to check where we are. Um, I want to show you a few case studies quickly. Uh, and again, beyond peace, okay? You will see the connections. You will see how it's connected to peace building in any way, but I want to show you how broad uh, are the games that are being created. And I want to show you especially hard data. So real numbers coming from evaluation. First case, I mentioned to you Sandra Day O'Connor. She came in 2008 and she said, you know, I'm, I'm now retiring from the Supreme Court justice. The first project I'm going to take is making video games around civic education. And the reason? She did her own anecdot anecdotal survey research among her grandkids and her friends. And she started asking, do you know what are the three branches of government? Guess what? Two out of three couldn't answer. She asked them, what are the three judges of American Idol? They all knew, like that. And she understood something. It's not only about, she didn't become pessimistic about you know, the ignorance. or She understood that popular media is succeeding where our education system is not. And that's why she decided to make those video games. She partnered with a great developer. That was one of her uh, best decisions. They made an NGO that is sustainable and running for a few years already. And they made a portfolio of more than 20 games that you can play. You know, Some of them you can play the president. Some of them you, you uh, understand the, um, the court system just by playing. Some of them are very short, but again, the idea that they didn't invest only in one game but made a portfolio was a very wise decision. The evaluation is very strong. It was played by more than 1.2 million students in all the states in the US. Um, the evaluation is strong not only uh, with the teachers that many of them say, yeah, it has great value, it's very compelling, the students love it, I'll recommend it to my peers. Um, I'm, they're definitely increasing their knowledge level, but it was so strong that it showed that the kids treated it almost as an entertainment product in the sense that many of them continue the experience at home, which is what we're trying to do with Games for Change. Um, the other case I want to show you is from the developing world, um, and we were inspired at Games for Change to do something similar on mobile phones. It's a local Indian developer that in 2005 decided to use uh, mobile games as an awareness campaign on HIV AIDS. Um, you have to understand those phones are still, um, those of you who don't know, the most dominant phones in places like India or Kenya, 70% uh, of the market. These are phones that they have no touch screen. They can play games, but it has to be 200 kilobytes, almost like a Word document. And, uh, and you need to compress everything to that scope. However, their 
if you get to the device, if you crack that, and it's not easy, because many of the people that hold those phones, they're not necessarily paying for data plans, and they're not necessarily downloading games. But if you figure out how to get to the phone, which can be with partnerships and mobile operators, you can get the numbers that they show. Because the competition then is not like what you have here, which you compete with 500 TV channels, especially in rural areas. And the numbers that ZMQ showed from India, millions of play sessions and millions of devices that got the, the phones embedded in, uh, the games embedded in them. Case number three, direct social action. I'm sure that many of you heard about Free Rice, the game uh, funded and uh, developed by, by the UN. It's a very simple example for this, but that's why I like using it. There are much more sophisticated examples nowadays, but the idea that you have this very simple quiz on the left side. Every time you get your answer right, rice is being donated in developing countries. So there is a, a, a correlation between what you do in the virtual world and what happens in the, in the real world. You might ask, why not just give the money, right? That's, that's some, sometimes the questions I hear. Just give the money you know, to, uh, and, and fight uh, hunger, and that's it. Why do you need the whole play thing? But that's the beauty of engagement. You engage people that otherwise would have zero awareness, zero connection to this, and they feel that they contribute just by playing. The numbers on, on, food, on free rice are really interesting for many years. It's, it's a game that was developed, I think, uh, in 2005. And look at the numbers, 8 million page views a day, 45 million grains of rice donated a day. And this is obviously with sponsors that are supporting this. Case number four, the power of the many. I don't know how many of you know of the example of Foldit. But think, this is from science. Think how uh, interesting it is to think about it in, in building peace. The idea that it's a guy who is a scientist in the University of Washington, and he said, I have this problem that I'm dealing with on a daily basis for years and years, folding proteins, okay? If you crack some of those puzzles, you can actually answer questions that are crucial in uh, cancer research and HIV AIDS research. So he said, what about if I create this simple game and I put it out there? His game became very popular, played by thousands of people uh, dozens of thousands of people across the, the world. Then he said, maybe I'll put a challenge out there. There is one specific challenge that we couldn't solve for 10 years, for a decade. And usually they use supercomputers. But supercomputers, as we, as we understand, they're very fast. And they can do things very, uh, multiple calculations. They're not very creative. So they put this one decade long uh, problem online. How much time it took the players to solve it? 10 days. So this is from Time Magazine. Um, it ended up as a, as a publication in Nature Magazine. I mean, and, and the players, by the way, are part of the authors, are the players of the game. And they solve it in 10 days. And, and this game keeps running. And now there are so many clones on so many other issues just trying to replicate this crowd gaming idea. So this is, by the way, it's not something in the virtual world that simulates something. Just like the example of free rice, the problem was solved in the real world. The game was just a gateway there. Uh, case number five, I'm going to uh, speak about very quickly the idea that we understand today that kids and the young generation is not only benefiting from playing games, they're also benefiting from making games. You know, we have it in art, we have it in, uh, in uh, filmmaking, the idea that you let uh, students, you let kids uh, experiment with the media and that this you know, structuring this experience by themselves is very beneficial. But in, in the case of games, there are many tools that make it very easy today for kids to engage. Uh, Scratch is the MIT uh, famous example, but you have a range of, of different platforms from hard to, from light to heavy, um, depending on how much coding you need to, to know. Sometimes you, you don't need any coding, but you definitely learn how, to, how coders think. And, um, what we also have is more and more challenges that say, let's make a challenge for kids to make games and show them to the world. One of them is the National STEM Challenge. Not many people know Obama announced it three years ago. They have 4,000 submissions a year 
by students from all over the country, middle school. Scholastic art and writing. This is a very interesting uh, example because it's a contest that goes for 80 years. People in high school get the golden key. Um, you can sometimes uh, look at uh, Andy Wall's images from, from uh, his period where he actually wears in, with pride the golden key he goes from Scholastic. Two years ago, they're coming to us and they say, we want to make game design a category. So Roger Tibbert, it's, it's art. And, and basically they say, we don't even know how to judge it. Is it about scripts, prototypes? You know, wh what, what is it going to be about? And, you, and we're starting to think about it in new ways. Um, the last case I want to show you is a case that really goes as far as you can think of, the most ambitious thing ever, which is behavior change. The case is a, a game that was created by Hope Lab. It's a, an organization in Silicon Valley, and it was targeted at cancer patients. And we're talking about uh, young adults uh, with cancer. And the, the game was mo mostly about understand what's, what you're going through in a much more compelling and clear way. They made a very robust evaluation that went into medical journals. And the, um, the stunning results is not only that they increased knowledge. The kids that played the game versus the control groups actually were more consistent in taking drugs and following the treatment. So that was a real behavior change just by playing that game, not as part of anything larger than that. What they also did, and this is here we're only scratching the surface and obviously a lot of caution with brain research, but the idea that we start seeing that games actually engaging different areas of the brain versus traditional media like books or movies uh, on the same topic. That's my last slide, or one before last. Uh, I really would like you to join us, whether it's by playing those games, uh, making those games, funding those games, thinking about games in a different way, going home and telling your uh, friends, parents, kids that, hey, I actually saw that there is something there. Maybe there are good games out there. And, um, and helping us making this change. Thank you very much. Elena, do you want one question? Do you want one question? Or? Yeah, we've got time for probably two questions, and then we'll move on to the panels. So any questions for Asi? I'm going to call them out. Whoever. Again, I'm wondering, are you working with the Ubisofts and the Electronic Arts with their, you know, big data metrics guys in terms of what is the sociology of these MMOs? Because, I mean... Yes, yeah, so, so that's a great question. And uh, for, for many years, the answer was no. And we couldn't get much traction. But in recent years, that changes as well. Uh, EA, Electronic Arts, is involved in a big project uh, out west called the Glass Lab which is trying to use IP from the gaming industry, like SimCity, and turn it into education. We worked with Zynga on a very big project. We made Half the Sky with Nicholas Kristof and Sher Wudan. There was a book, a documentary. We made the games. We produced them. And Zynga helped us in distribution. And just by that help, we reached um, 1 million to 50,000 people in one year which in any other way as an independent game, we couldn't have, have done it. So uh, we see more of that happening. I wish to see more uh, in following years as well. Because like you say, they do have the knowledge, they do have the talent, and they do have the data. One more. Yeah, yeah. Can we take one more question? Have you also taken part in efforts to improve uh, the behavior on and offline of people playing other more conventional games? Riot Games, for example, has done some interesting experiments on trying to adjust discourse norms among players. Right. So, so that's, uh, there's a whole uh, research around uh, people doing research and experiments with commercial games, especially if they're nonviolent. But there are some people that 
argue that even violent games have positive benefits uh, in terms of quick decision making and uh, cognition. But especially the nonviolent games, uh, people are doing a lot of research. They're, they're doing experiments. Like, for example, I, I, um, uh, I uh, heard about one a very robust study in World of Warcraft around uh, the, uh, how rapid a virus uh, was able to spread, uh, but at the same time, what was the community reaction and how they were able to fight it back. Um, so just by those dynamics, nothing to do with the intention of the designers, right? It just was an emerging thing from the community. So thank you very much. I'm thank sure we you. could have more t uh, questions, but uh, we have to move on to our panel. So please give us a round of applause. Thank you.